What does Ferrari, Arsenal and Linux desktop have in common? Next year is definitely our year. Every year for the past 10 years it's been the exact same story. Next year they promise that it will be different, that they will finally bring it home. And every year they fall short. You get nothing! You lose! Good day sir! Leaving fans with just enough hopium to convince themselves that next year will be better. But this year, well this year is actually different. Not for Ferrari. They're doing worse than ever. They spent an ungodly amount of money to get the most successful driver of all time, and he is now consistently getting eliminated in Q1. Ferrari is not second, and not even third. They're comfortably fourth. Next year, right guys? Not the same story for Arsenal. Liverpool have nosedived off a cliff so hard, it's just uncomfortable to watch, and Arsenal have just been going from strength to strength. And for Linux desktop, well, Valve has consistently been putting love into Linux, to the point where it now outperforms Windows for the same games. And then they announced Linux hardware that completely blew the PC community away. Meanwhile, the desktop community is stronger than ever with documentation, compatibility, and ease of use at an all-time high. PewDiePie regularly uploads videos discussing Linux, home labs, self-hosting, and digital freedom. Linux is more popular than ever, and for good reason. People are getting fed up with Microsoft. One of the interesting projects to come out of this Linux renaissance is Omachi, a configuration for Arch and Hyperland created by the creator of Ruby on Rails. And honestly, Omachi is exactly what Linux needs right now. An opinionated distro with a strong community that's easy to install, well documented and works out of the box. But it's definitely not perfect and it has a major flaw that I think risks killing the project altogether. Linux users have a tendency to blatantly lie about the shortcomings of Linux desktop. It comes from a good place. We just want open source to win and big corporations to lose. We want things to be better than they are, so we are happy to ignore glaring flaws for the greater good. But this is not going to be that kind of video. Omachi is still Linux and there's a whole lot of issues that come with that and definitely some deal breakers. Omachi is created by DHH, who is a controversial figure at the best of times. His involvement alone will be enough to discourage some people from using it altogether. He is most famous for creating Ruby on Rails, but I actually prefer some of his other contributions. He is a co-author for Getting Real and contributed to ShapeUp, which are two of my favorite software development books ever, both of which are freely available online, as is WriteBook, the tool used to publish these books online. Despite WriteBook being proprietary, David is a big fan of open source. He has maintained Ruby on Rails since its creation some 20 years ago. He is also very opinionated. He likes things a certain way and expects others to follow suit. So when he got stuck down the Linux rising rabbit hole, as we all often do, he decided to share his configuration as something that could be used by all developers. This initially started with Omakub, an Omakase developer set up for Ubuntu. Omakub is not a massive change from default Ubuntu. It's just a little nicer to get started. It comes pre-installed with developer tools like NeoVim, VS Code, and Docker, and has some nice themes that change across the whole system. But the most important changes are the workflow ones. It has better window management that lets you use keyboard shortcuts to move between workspaces and resize windows and it has a better launcher pre-configured. It's just a nicer Ubuntu experience out of the box, which makes it easier to get started with Linux when coming from a traditional OS, while still giving you the advantages that come with switching. Omicub is simple and definitely not revolutionary, but it can be a great option for people who want to try out Linux, but don't want to deal with the configuration nightmare it can quickly become. Eventually, David realized that he needed more. And once again, as we often do, he dug deeper eventually getting lost in tiling window managers. It happens to the best of us. But this is where the magic happens. He took the lessons from Omakub and brought them into the world of Arch and Hyperland, creating Omachi. Omachi takes it to the next level. It's a complete developer workstation in an ISO file. It comes preloaded with Ghosty, Docker, and even NeoVim configured with LazyVim. Hyperland is already all set up with a user experience that is intuitive and easy to use with excellent documentation for when you get stuck. There is something special about Omachi. Linux has always been customizable, and that's one of its greatest strengths. But even as a nerd, I get overwhelmed when I want to experiment. What distribution should I use? With what desktop environment? And which window manager? 
You could already make thousands of different setups with just these three decisions, and we haven't even started customizing anything yet. And now that you have your own specific permutation of dependencies, you have configured yourself out of getting any help when something goes wrong. Especially when the bug is an edge case that only happens with a specific set of dependencies. The Linux ecosystem could really benefit from an opinionated configuration with a strong community that reduces the variance. And who better to do it than the guy who managed to convince thousands of developers to use Ruby and Rails. It's really nice to have your Amachi community to lean on whenever there is an issue. There were multiple times when I had an issue with Arch or my bootloader, and someone in the thread would say, here's what fixed it for me on Omachi, and their solution just worked for me too. That's what's great about using something that's popular. The problem with a lot of other popular Linux distros is that they don't really do anything differently. There's definitely pushing factors, with Windows being a bloated mess of garbage and macOS being locked to hardware. But there isn't a pulling factor other than just, it's not Windows. Mint just tries to mimic Windows, and a bunch of other desktop environments try to mimic macOS. And GNOME is just weird. Don't lie, you do not feel at home with GNOME. I want to use Omachi, not just because I'm looking to escape Windows, but because using a tiling window manager is the best experience. It's absolutely terrible by default on other operating systems, and it's configured so nicely on Omachi. The key bindings are powerful and easily accessible. The themes are awesome, and I love how they affect the whole system. The global menu is such a great addition that helps the system feel like mine. I like working here, it's a great experience, and I want to use it over macOS and Windows, not just because it's free and open source, but because it has better systems. It's just a pleasure to use a windowing system that's actually well designed, and intended to be keyboard driven. I don't have to fight my windows to get them to show the information I want. Most of the time it just happens, and I'm not even that cooked on resizing and moving keybinds. I usually just leave things as they are. Workspaces with a tiling window manager is just the most efficient way to interact with a computer. You open the application selector by pressing Alt space. When you open a window, it just grows to take up the full screen. If you open multiple windows, they just split themselves evenly. You can change the currently selected window by pressing Alt arrow key and change the window position by pressing Alt shift arrow key. You can move between workspaces by pressing Alt number and move a window to a workspace by pressing Alt shift number. It's unapologetically unique in the ways that I wish other operating systems were. I use aerospace on my MacBook and at least once a day, I'll just lose a window to the void and I have to go into the view where everything is tiny and small to try to get it back. And I've completely given up on window management on Windows. You also have some special shortcuts to open dedicated applications directly, like Alt Shift B for the browser. If you're unsure about the keybinds, you can press Alt K to bring up a searchable list, which includes all shortcuts for Amachi. This menu is part of a larger menu system called the Omachi menu. This menu is what makes the system feel so configurable and easy to use at the same time. You can bring it up by pressing Alt Control Space, and it has a bunch of settings to install and remove applications, change themes, and configure your system. They're pretty hardcore about theming, so much so that they forked Chrome just to add a patch where they can change the theme in real time without restarting the application. At the end of the day, Omachi is just shell scripts and config files, so you can still customize it to your heart's content. For example, I have a simple script that disables the top bar by default. It also removes some apps that I don't want, and installs ones I do want. And it's super easy to get up and running with, probably even easier than Omicub since Omachi comes with its own ISO file that you can just use directly. And it's still Linux, so you get all the advantages that come with that. You get a fast machine with low overhead that is truly yours to change how you wish. But on the other hand, it's also still Linux in all the bad ways. And while Proton is better than ever, and compatibility is at an all-time high, Linux still has some serious quirks, including some that are just non-negotiables for a lot of professionals. I'm not going to patronize you. You know what the 80-20 rule, also known as the parakeet principle. It got its name because parakeets use 20% of the materials to build a nest 80% as strong. The parakeet principle does not apply to operating systems. We are extremely reliant on computers to do many things. Some of those things we all do every day. Chromebooks have shown that we can get very far with just a web browser. But even if you're not a professional in that field, there will come a time where you want to touch up a photo, edit a video, record some music, or play a game with invasive anti-cheat. 
and depending on your use case, most of these will just not work on Linux. Being able to run 80% of the apps you need is nowhere near good enough, honestly. Musical plugins like VSTs and audio units are temperamental even through translation layers. Popular games like League of Legends or Battlefield 6 are just not playable online. None of the video editors you're used to run natively on Linux. In fact, all Adobe products are notoriously difficult to run on Linux. Many of these tools are used by people to collaborate on their work. There is always an alternative, but even then, these alternatives have you jumping through hoops that no Mac or Windows user has ever had to jump through. For example, it's not that bad that Photoshop is not available on Linux especially since Canva just bought all Affinity products and made them free to use under Affinity Studio. For Windows and Mac users, this was as simple as downloading it directly from the website. For Linux, the story is a little bit more complicated. Install Wine Tricks. Install Lutris, download and extract the wine fork. Copy and paste the wine fork to the Lutris's system directory. Download and install the script for your wine fork. Open Lutris and click the plus button on the top left corner of the window. Press Install from Easy enough, right? I actually think the process might be a little bit easier now that Affinity has been free for a few weeks, but when I did it on release, this is what I had to do. And yeah, it's all following a guide, but I know people who spend five hours a day on the computer that still wouldn't bother with all this. This amount of work is what you can be expected to put in semi-regularly just to get something running. Keeping in mind that Affinity is the alternative to Adobe, which as far as I can tell, doesn't work at all regardless of how much time you're willing to put in. Here's another example that's not as bad, but also worse somehow. Do you remember Valve, the company that I mentioned at the start of the video, who has been single-handedly revolutionizing Linux gaming? Well, Deadlock, a first-party game that they make, refused to work on my computer. After digging through many forums and trying different launch options for hours, I finally landed on this magical phrase that makes the game work properly. Omachi has its own little quirks on top of this as well. I have a simple script I run after install that removes all the bloatware apps and replaces them with open source alternatives. But it's a bit sad that I have to do this. And for some people, especially hardcore Linux people, it will be a massive deal breaker. But there is a much bigger deal breaker that affects everyone and absolutely needs to be addressed if Omachi is to succeed. And that is stability. I don't know if you remember it like I do, but updates were different 10 to 20 years ago. Updating anything, whether it was your text editor, your operating system, or your browser, was basically a 50-50 chance that you would lose everything you've ever owned. There was this ever-present fear that updating would cost you the next four hours of your life as you tried to get your files back into the right format. It hadn't occurred to me until I tried Omachi, but things just aren't like that anymore. I run Brew Upgrade and I just get a bunch of new features and small bugs that have been annoying me for days magically go away. Sometimes you get some instantification, but if you've picked the right products, it's like Christmas every couple weeks when you get free stuff without doing anything. I say this didn't occur to me before using Omachi because Omachi is not like this at all. Omachi has brought back the anxiety that I haven't felt in years, probably decades. Every update brings its own random bug, a surprisingly high number of which affect the bootloader, which means I can't even go back to the old revision to fix the issue. Omachi has brought back the habit that boomers still have where I just ignore all updates. Except I ran Pacman update to update a package and it broke the bootloader because Omachi needed to run its own migration to fix a regression. I just can't win. Looking at the forums and issues, it also seems like these issues affect a very large percentage of the user base. It's not like there is an update and every time a very small vocal minority is quickly reporting bugs. No, there's an update and every single user will see hash codes instead of package names when trying to install any new programs. It's like they didn't even bother to test anything at all before pushing the update live. I'm hypothesizing here, obviously, but to me, this is another symptom of Amarchi's origin. DHH is famous for creating Ruby on Rails, which is hardly the most robust and stable piece of software ever created. Furthermore, his most successful product is Basecamp, a product management SaaS. The difference between a SaaS product and an operating system is that honestly, nobody cares if something breaks on Basecamp. 
Websites break all the time and we've just learned to live with it. If the issue is bad enough, it will usually be fixed within a few hours thanks to continuous delivery. And if the issue isn't bad enough to be fixed, you can just close the website and open another one. Taking the principles commonly used to create SaaS products and applying them to an operating system is a terrible idea. My operating system breaking in unexpected ways is just about the worst thing my computer could do. And deployments and updates are slow, so issues last enough to affect everyone using the OS. I have had so many issues whenever I've updated Omachi. The first one was the first time I updated, where the install gave me a prompt asking to overwrite my NeoVim config. I used my own config, so I chose no, and the update stopped without completing any of the other steps and left my computer in a broken state. I could barely boot back into the system. People online said they just fixed it by reinstalling from scratch which I'm sorry, but that's not a solution. I had to dig into the source code to find the commands that Omachi runs to update and manually run them to finish the update properly. The second update was the one where updating my packages caused the bootloader to reset its config. Once again, I could barely get into the system and I had to manually rewrite the bootloader config to boot from the right files. After that, I just stopped updating, although it must have automatically updated because a few days after I saw it all over the forums, I encountered the issue where all the package names were hashes, so I couldn't install the package I wanted to install. Omachi really is special, and it will remain my daily driver for the foreseeable future. I believe in the project, and I think it will succeed. Linux desktop is better than ever. And comparing like for like, I enjoy using Omachi more than I do Windows, even despite all its flaws. It just took me booting back into Windows to find an Xbox advertisement on the lock screen and then being held hostage with a Windows 11 update to remind me why I hate this so much. But I will keep a spare Windows hard drive around in case I need to dual boot, because chances are I will. Reflecting on my thoughts, I'm reminded of Omarcub, the first version, the OS that wasn't trying to do too much. Omarcub is insanely stable, especially compared to Omachi. Omarcub might even still be the better choice for most people right now. It's simple, light, stable, and can even run in a VM, which Omachi can't because of Hyperland. Maybe we've overcooked it a bit. If we just chill out, focus on the fundamentals first, and then build up from there, I really think that Omachi can become the best developer operating system available. It's about time we had a change. Surely 2026 will be the year of the Linux desktop.